Okay, now I'm going to define a second way of multiplying vectors, and this time it takes two vectors v and w and gives you another vector. Okay, therefore it's called the vector product, and it's written with a cross in between, so it's also sometimes called the cross product. So let me define what this is. The definition is a bit more tricky than for the scalar product, but I'll do it in three steps. Okay, so first of all, I'll define the length of this vector. So v cross w gives me a vector. The length of this vector is equal to the length of v times the length of w times sine of theta. So very similar to the scalar product result, but with sine instead of cos. Okay, that's the first statement. So that tells you how long the vector should be. Now I have to define the direction of the vector. The next statement is that the cross product, v cross w, is perpendicular to both v and w. Okay. So an important thing about the vector product is it's only defined in three dimensions. Okay. So, and this is why, because this way of specifying the direction is only uniquely well defined in three dimensions. So let me draw a picture to see what it looks like. I have my original vectors v and w like that. So these two vectors define some kind of plane. Right? They define a two-dimensional plane in three dimensions. Okay, And this vector product, whatever it sh is, should be perpendicular to v and w. So that means it should be at 90 degrees to this plane. So the vector product is going to stick up something like this, v cross w, up like this. Okay, it should be at 90 degrees to v and at 90 degrees to w. So I've defined its length and I've defined its direction, but you see it's still not quite unique because I could choose it pointing this way or I could have chosen it pointing that way. Both of these vectors have the same length, and they are both perpendicular to v and w. So how do I know to choose this one and not that one? Okay. Well, this is the content of the third part of the definition, which says that the direction um, of the vector product is determined using something called the right-hand rule. Okay, so the right hand rule means the following. You take your right hand, that's this one for me, and you imagine that with your hand you push the vector, the first vector, which is v, and you push it towards the second vector, which is w. So in this case, I have to start from v here, and I have to push it towards w this way. Okay, and then if you do this, the direction your thumb is pointing will tell you the direction of the vector product. So in this case, if you imagine, take this plane and you push the vector v towards the vector w, then your thumb will be pointing up. So that means you should choose the vector pointing up here and not this one pointing down. Okay, so this right-hand rule, there are a few other rules, like the, there's one called the corkscrew rule. Um, some people like to use their three fingers like this to tell you which way it should be and so on. Um, they all give you the same result. So you can ask why, this looks fairly arbitrary, right? Why don't we use a left-hand rule where I take my left hand and then push the vector v towards the vector w and then my thumb will be pointing down in this case. So why do we use the right hand and not the left hand? Well, it's just a convention. If everybody used the left-hand rule, it wouldn't matter. If everybody uses the right-hand rule, it doesn't matter. The problem is if half of the people decide to use left and half of the people decide to use right, then you have an issue. Okay. So whether it's right or left doesn't matter as long as everybody agrees. And um, because I guess most people are right-handed, they chose to use the right-hand rule rather than the left-hand one. Right, so this uniquely defines the vector product, right? I've told you how long it should be. I've told you it should be perpendicular to v and w. And finally, I've told, told you to choose the direction using this right-hand rule. 
So that's the definition. However, again, if I have the components of V and W in an orthonormal basis, so suppose I have the vectors V, which is Vx, Vy, Vz, and W, which is Wx, Wy, Wz. So if I have these vectors, the components in an orthonormal basis, orthonormal is essential, then you can show the following. V cross W is Vx, Vy, Vz cross Wx, Wy, Wz. So this is equal to Vy, Wc minus Vc, Wy minus Vx, Wc plus Vc, Wx and Vx, Wy minus Vy, Wx. So that's quite a complicated formula. Luckily, there's some symmetry. There's an easy way to remember it. Let's suppose I want to find the x component here. So let's suppose I wanted to find this value here. Okay. What you need to do is look at the other values in V and W. So if I want to find this one, then I should look at the if I want to find the x component, then I should look at the y and z components. And within these components you make a cross. So you do this one times this one and then this one times this one. Okay. And this way is plus and this way is minus. Okay. So that gives you that, right? V y times W Z is that minus V Z times W Y, which is that. Okay, similarly, this is gonna make a mess, I think, but anyway, let me try. Um, if you wanted to find this one. So this is the y component of the vector product, so it involves the x and z components here, so I need to do this one times this one. That's vx wz, like that. and then vz wx is that. Okay, but note this time, this is always confuses people. In the middle one, the minus is the other way around. So in the middle one, this one is minus and this one is plus. Whereas in the first and third one, this one is plus and this one is minus. Okay, and then I may as well complete finish making a mess. Finally, if I want to get this last one here, the z component, then I need to multiply the x and y components together in a cross like this. So vx wy minus vy wc. Okay, so that gives you the formula there. Again, it's not easy to prove that this is the same as this, but um, I will do it in a video later on. Okay. So for now, you can just believe me. Right, so that defines the vector product and tells you how to calculate it in an orthonormal basis. Finally, as I did with the scalar product, I'll finish with an example. So I'll take the same vectors as I did in the previous video. So V is this, W is this. So let's compute V cross W is this cross this. Okay, so if I start with the X component, to find the X component, I need to do this times that, which is one minus this times that which is minus 6. Okay. To find the y component, I need to do minus this, which is 2. Plus this, this times this, which again is minus 6. And to find the z component, 
I need to do this times this, 2 times 2, which is 4, minus this times this, 1 times 2, which is 2. Okay. So this gives you 1 plus 6 is 7, minus 2 minus 6 is minus 8, and 4 minus 2 is 2. Okay. So that's the answer. So one thing which is nice to do, I think, you may well have made a mistake here, an easy way of checking that you probably haven't made a mistake is to check this property. So to check that V cross W is perpendicular to V. How can you do that? You can just do it from the scalar product. Remember that if two vectors are perpendicular, then their scalar product should be equal to zero. So in this case, I get 7 minus 8, 2, dot product, 2, 1, minus 3, which is 14 minus 8 minus 6, which indeed is 0. Okay, so that looks good. I probably haven't made a mistake then. So I've checked that V vector product W is perpendicular to V. And similarly, you can check that V cross W is perpendicular to W by taking the scalar product with w. This will be 7 minus 8, 2, dot product 2, 2, 1, which is 14 minus 16 plus 2, which again is 0. Good. Okay, So I'm almost certainly right for this answer. OK, so this defines the vector product, which is the second way you can multiply vectors only in three dimensions. The scalar product can be defined in any dimension, but the vector product only works in three dimensions. So in the remaining videos, I'm going to show you a few applications of these uh, vector product and scalar products.